So you guys have probably heard me talk about this before, Gen Zeal. And originally when I started using this, I really felt like the Lord was saying, hey, Gen Z, it was really for the Gen Z people. Uh, wake up, it's time for you to rise up and take your position in the church. Um, but also, I don't believe this is just for the Gen Z, which God is re-identifying, but it's also for all of us in this generation. So you guys that are in this room, are counted as part of the Gen Zeal. Yeah. The part part of what God is doing in the church right now in this season. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. You guys ready? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. I want all of you guys to also remember that all of you all of you have a big calling on your life. There's not a single person in here that has a little calling. There's no such thing. And the high priest, who is our high priest? Jesus. Jesus Christ has called all of us to be, he's called us into his priestly order. And everyone, that's a big calling, isn't it? Yeah. Every single person in this room has been called into the priestly order of Jesus Christ. And we, each one have been called. And what is that famous line from Esther? That she, For such a time as this. Yes. Perhaps. But I'm not saying, I'm saying there is no perhaps. You have come into the kingdom for such a time as this. Every one of us in this room is essential to what God is doing in this season. And every one of us has come into the kingdom for this time. Let's say that together. Say, I have come into the kingdom, I have come into the kingdom for a time, for, for, such, for such a time as this. this. Alright, let's do that one more time. I have come into the kingdom, I have come into the kingdom for such a time as this. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. All right. We're going to kick this off by talking about Balak and Balaam. You guys know about them? Yeah. How many of you guys know the story of King Balak and Balaam? Okay, we're going to do a refresher. We're going to do a refresher real quick. This is all coming out of chapters 22 through 24. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. I am going to read a lot of scripture tonight, but I'm going to cut through this part pretty quick. But this is in Numbers 22 through 24. And basically what's happening at this point is Israel has asked the Amorites, that's a nation of people, the Amorites, and actually the Amorites were known for being a giant tribe. But he, they asked them, can we please pass through your land? We promise we won't take any of, you, any of your, we won't take any of your food, we won't drink your water, we just want to move through peacefully. But the Amorites do not permit that, and instead they wage war on the Israelites. God gives the Israelites a miraculous victory but this is a big deal because the Amorites were, in, they were greatly feared in the region. Remember, they were a tribe of giants. They were greatly feared in the region. And it actually says that they had taken many cities and land from another tribe that was there called the Moabites. And so when they were wiped out, the Moabites were really freaking out. I mean, they were afraid of the Amorites, but they just saw someone mess up the Amorites. And so in their minds, they're thinking, oh my gosh, things have just gone from bad to worse. And they see this huge group, this huge wandering tribe, this caravan called Israel, right? And it actually says in the Bible that when they saw this happen, the Moabites were in great dread and overcome with fear. They couldn't beat the Amorites. What were they going to do against the people that beat the Amorites, right? So King Balak had this incredible epiphany. He said, maybe, just maybe, we can beat these people if we can curse them. If we curse them, maybe it'll bring them down a notch and we might be able to succeed. So then he reaches out to a very famous prophet in the region. His name was Balaam. And Balaam is, is, is an interesting character because he actually is famous because he has a conversational relationship with God. He does hear God. He talks to God. And he's famous because since he has this conversational with God, what he blesses is blessed, and what he curses is cursed. So Balak sends this amazing, all of his best guys, his delegation with all this treasure, and he sends them all to Balaam. And Balaam says, okay, guys, hold on a sec. I'll talk to God about it. He walks in, talks to God. God says, no. Okay, sorry, guys. God says, no. <laughs> so what do they do? Balak sends another, even better delegation with more pomp, more circumstance, I guess you could say that. 
And so, he, so this great group of leaders and princes come, on, come to Balaam with this great amount of treasure. And what does Balaam do? He says, eh, I'll ask again. So he goes in and knocks on God's door again and says, hey, can I go curse these people? <laughs> this time, God says, go ahead. And I think that's interesting because sometimes God gives us things because he gives us the desires of our hearts. And sometimes we knock on his door and say, can I have this? And he says, no, but we'll ask again. And he says, hey, if that's what you really want, go for it. Right? It's kind of a wake up call. So here we have Balaam. Balaam is also an interesting character. So God says, go ahead and go. And here, we, let's look at a scripture real quick. Because as much as he had the power of God in his life, it also says there was a perverseness about him. And we see, can we see the next slide? In Numbers 22, 32, an angel stops him. You guys know the story about the donkey. He's riding his donkey. An angel stops the donkey. He talks, Balaam talks to his donkey. His donkey talks back. <laughs> as if that's not enough and suddenly the angel reveals himself and says man it's a good thing your donkey stopped you or I was going to kill you and this is what the angel says he says behold I have come out to stand against you because your way is perverse before me so we have this guy who can hear the voice of God has a power of blessing and cursing but he has perverseness in his heart Balaam hears the Lord but there's perversion in him so then King Balak's representatives meet with Balaam, and he finally says, okay, he goes with him. On his way, he runs into the angel. So we have, in this situation, Balaam asked, God said no. Balaam asked again, God said, go ahead. Balaam goes, an angel stops in front of him. If, the, if his donkey hadn't stopped, an angel would have killed him. God is opposed to his perverse way. At this point, Balaam says, hey, I'll go home if you want me to. God already said no the first time. He said, go ahead and do what you want. So, but God says, no, you go ahead and do what you want to do at this point. But only say what I tell you to say. And Balaam says, okay. And he carries on his way. What do you think was Balaam's perverse way? The true desire of his heart wasn't for the Lord, but for the honor and reward offered by the world. A man that you could call a man of God, who could hear God, who could talk to God, who had the power of God operating through his life in such a way that the whole world knew it, and yet he had perverseness in him because he was actually more drawn into the wealth and the power and the fame than he was actually into the heart of God. So as the story goes, King Balak repeatedly positions Balaam. He puts him in different positions on different mountains where he can see the tribe. And he says, okay, I'll put you over here. Now curse him. And instead he starts speaking a blessing because he can only do what God's saying. And God's only going to bless Israel. And then he moves him to another place and says, okay, maybe over here you can curse him. Nope. He blesses him some more. And then over here, try this side, try this side. And then he blesses him some more. <laughs> King Balak is getting so irritated. <laughs> Balaam cannot curse a people whom God is blessing. Do you realize your life is the same way? There's so many nuggets in this. If we're living under the umbrella and the boundaries of the Lord's blessing, we are uncursable. If we're living under the umbrella and within the boundaries of God's blessing, we are uncursable. That's so frustrating for the enemy. <laughs> Say, if I live in the Lord's boundaries, if I, live in the Lord's boundaries I remain under the umbrella of blessing. Now this time, say it like you believe it. <laughs> Jeez, I'm not at a dirge here. Come on, this is a funeral. If I live in the Lord's boundaries, I remain under the umbrella of his blessing. Thank you, Lord. Balaam in his perverseness comes up with a crafty idea. So he can't curse them. But he really does want that reward. So he, you know, who is the crafty one? You guys remember in the Garden of Eden, there was a crafty one too, right? That craftiness is always the heart of Satan. But he taps into the heart of Satan instead of doing what God wants. And he gives Balak some advice. If Israel can be lured away from the secure boundaries of blessing, then they'll come out from that umbrella and they'll be entrapped. Numbers 31, 16, it says, Look, 
these women caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to trespass against the Lord in the incident of Peor. And there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. Through the counsel of Balaam, through the advice of Balaam, King Balak sent his most beautiful women to entice Israel into sin and trespassing. Trespassing means to cross the line. So the whole plan is, if I can get the blessed people to cross out of their boundaries, then they'll step into the curse zone. The devil still does that stuff. When Balaam couldn't curse Israel, he gave Balak some incredible, evil, timeless advice. Balak and the Moabites do exactly that, and the men of Israel trespass and dive headlong into sexual sin and then make Israel susceptible to the curse. So now we're going to read a whole lot. Are you ready? We're gonna, if you want to open your Bibles or it's going to be up behind us, we're going to look at Numbers 25. And we're going to go through the story of what happens next. So this is where we are. Everything I just talked about, this is what happens next, okay? Numbers 25, and we're going to start in verse 1. And we're looking at the New King James Version up here. Now Israel remained in Acacia Grove, and the people began to commit harlotry with the women of Moab. They invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel was joined to Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was roused against Israel. How did Balaam know this would work so well? It's not because he was super wise. This is the most repeated cycle of bondage in the history of the world. <laughs> it's an old scheme of the devil, and it still works. I call this the slide of compromise or do the doctrine of Balaam. We're going to keep reading numbers in a second. But this is what happens here. We have unholy fellowship, leads us into sexual sin, leads us into idolatry, leads us into bondage, leads us into the curse. The enemy is doing the same thing today that he's always done. Unholy fellowship leads to sexual sin, leads to idolatry, leads to bondage, leads to curse. Israel joined themselves to Bel. Did you see that in the, in the previous scripture we just read? It said that Israel was joined to Bel. Israel was supposed to be like us, the church, the bride of Christ. And they threw off that marriage and married themselves to somebody else. They loosed themselves from Yahweh and bound themselves to Baal. The English Standard Version says that Israel cast off its yoke with God in order to be yoked with Baal. Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, I don't have that scripture, but he says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Everybody's going to pick a yoke. Right. We're all going to pick a yoke. 2 Corinthians 6. We're looking at 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to 16. It says, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. We cannot be yoked to both God and anything else. We can't be yoked to God and Belial, which is another name for Satan. It means worthless one. And we could say the same thing about Baal. We can't be yoked with light and with darkness because the light eradicates the darkness. Balaam knew that these two kingdoms could not coexist. You see all those stickers on the back of cars, coexist? That's a lie. There's no such thing as coexisting. Balaam knew that. And he knew that these two kingdoms could not coexist, and therefore the men of Israel needed to be lured into another yoke. And it wasn't just the scoundrels in the camp that fell for it. It was the princes, the leaders, the people of influence dove headlong into sin and ushered in the rest of that nation. And when they pulled the nation out from the umbrella of blessing, out of the boundaries of God, when they caused the whole nation to trespass, then what happened? Curse. A curse, a plague fell on the camp. 
And we're going to continue in Numbers 25. Now we're on verse 4. And the Lord told Moses to literally hang the leaders out to dry. So verse 4, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Take all the leaders of the people and hang the offenders before the Lord out in the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. So Moses said to the judges of Israel, Every one of you, kill his men who were joined to Bel of Peor. Whoa. Carrying on, verse 6. And indeed, one of the children of Israel came and presented to his brethren a Midianite woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight, listen to this, of all of the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping at the door of the tabernacle meeting. All of those people were on their faces repenting before the Lord. And it says that this Israelite, who was actually one of the leaders, it says in another verse that he was a leader, he was a chief, he was a prince of, of Israel. And, he, and the girl that he had was actually a prince of the Moabites princess and he brought her it, it says presented her but really he's what all these people are on their faces laying on the ground weeping and crying out in repentance and it's like he's got this girl with him and they're stepping through them and over them through the repenting crowd to his tent verse 7 now when Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, saw it, he rose from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand, and he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through, the man of Israel and the woman through her body. So the plague was stopped among the children of Israel. Verse 9. And those who died in the plague were how many? 24,000. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, has turned back my wrath from the children of Israel, because he was zealous with my zeal among them, so that I did not consume the children of Israel in my zeal. Notice that you see the word zeal three times there, right? In Hebrew, this is the word kina. And it means passion, ardor, intense devotion, fervor. Can you even imagine what's what this means, and we can all have zeal. But what does it mean to have the zeal of God? David is said to have had a heart after God, right? I think that's just another way to say this. Zeal for God. It's a passionate devotion. It's a, it's a passion for holiness of God. It's a passion for his name, for his way, for his kingdom. He had a heart that was intensely devoted to glorifying God. Let's look at verse 12, carrying on. Therefore say, this is God talking here, Behold, I give to him my covenant of peace, and it shall be to him and his descendants after him a covenant of an everlasting priesthood, because he was what? Zealous, Zealous for his God and made atonement for the children of Israel. Let's also look at Psalm 106. This is Psalm 106, verse 30 and 31. I love this. We're going to talk more about this at the end too, but... Then Phineas stood up and intervened, and the plague was stopped, and that was accounted to him for righteousness to all generations forevermore. Do you remember who else it says? Some, it says kind of this similar phrasing about somebody else famous in the Bible. It says this person had something, and it was accounted to them as righteousness. Do you remember that? Abraham. Abraham. And what did he have? Faith. 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 Right. So we see that two times in the Bible. The first time is with Abraham, and it says his faith was accounted to him as righteousness. Here we see it with Phineas, and it was his action that was accounted to him as righteousness. Why do you think that was? Because it was an action of faith, because he had the zeal of the Lord in his heart. Woo, Jesus, I want some of that. His zealous actions saved lives, and it marked him righteous before the Lord. And God promised Phineas, God promised Phineas, shalom. Peace and an eternal priesthood. He said forevermore. So he was brought into what we could also talk about is the priesthood of Melchizedek, which is also the priesthood of Jesus Christ. It is the eternal priesthood. It was the priesthood that existed before the Israelites ever came into the picture. If you remember Abraham, he met with, with Melchizedek, who was the priest of God. He's part of it, which is also uh, a picture of Jesus Christ and may have even been Jesus meeting with Abraham. But there is an eternal priesthood. Jesus has given us access to, and not only that access, 
It's not just a door we walk through. It's the big calling on each one of us and our official label and our identity. We are kings and priests. We are a kingdom of priests, yeah. right? So the leader who Phineas harpooned was named Zimri. There's an old Hebrew expression, and I think this is interesting. It applies a lot to our present time that we live in. But there's an old Hebrew expression about hypocrites. And it says that a hypocrite is one who acts like Zimri and asks for a reward as if they are Phineas. A hypocrite is someone who acts like Zimri and asks for a reward like Phineas. Ooh, wow, 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 wow. Zimri didn't care about the Lord. He didn't care about the lives being lost. He was proudly pursuing his own lust, even while the faithful were on their faces in repentant prayer. In the church today, there are actual leaders who are operating with unholy contempt like Zimri, but they're expecting a reward like Phineas. That's called a hypocrite. Thank you, Lord. So let's talk about Phineas a little bit more. So Phineas, during this time he's, they were talking about he was a young man, but one day he would become the third high priest. The first high priest was Aaron, the second high priest was Eleazar, and the third high priest is Phineas. Now if you look at the little diagram behind me, you also notice that Eleazar was actually the third son of Aaron. He was not supposed to be the high priest. It was first supposed to go to Nadab, and then if it didn't go to Nadab, it was supposed to go to Ab Abihu. Any of you guys know what happened to Nadab and, Ab and Abihu? <laughs> Who knows? Anybody? What happened? Do you know Luna? What, how? What happened? So it says in the Bible, let's see, it says it over here in, I don't have the slide for it, but Numbers 3, 4, it says that Nadab and Abihu died when they offered profane fire before the Lord in the wilderness, and they didn't have any children. And so actually, that probably happened before Phineas was born. It was right after they first set up the entire tabernacle and the sacrificial process. All of that was first initiated. And then, bam, first thing these two dudes do is they don't follow the rules. And uh, things do not go well for them. They were lit up, and not in a good way. So... God had given Phineas' uncles very clear directions that they were supposed to take a censer full of burning coals of fire from the altar before the Lord. If they brought fire that was profane, which also means unauthorized, strange, or foreign, we can assume that they got it from somewhere other than the altar. So they decided they were going to add a fire other than the holy fire. Oof. When they brought false fire, the true fire of God burned them up. This goes back also back to the illustration of the yoke. God doesn't share. God's glorious kingdom of light doesn't mix. It doesn't mingle with darkness. It annihilates the darkness. God's holy fire annihilates profane fire. Fire can also be a picture of the zeal or passion in our hearts. Because we can all be fired up for something, can't we? What is the fire within me? That's the question we should be asking ourselves. We can be driven by a holy passion to serve the Lord. Or we can be driven by a worldly passion. But the glorious power, the glorious, powerful presence of God burns against those worldly passions because they're at odds with the kingdom of heaven. This is what happened right after they were burned up. Leviticus 10.3. It says, And Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near to me, I must be regarded as holy. And before all the people, I must be glorified. So Aaron held his peace. Can you imagine being the dad who just had his oldest two fried because they didn't take God seriously? Do you think Aaron and Eleazar took Yahweh and his holiness a little bit more seriously after that? I'll bet Eleazar was very intentional and clear after that about how he raised his son. He raised Phineas with a holy fear and passionate reverence for the Lord. Yahweh must be regarded as holy and must be glorified. Man, we think we can play around with God. And that's part of this false teaching that modern church, we've, we've so much embraced. A false teaching that we can toy with God. We don't have to take him seriously. That we can do whatever he wants and he's fine. God is an all-consuming fire. 
Let's go back to that tree, the family tree one more time. This is also important. Eleazar was also the transitional generation. Eleazar was the transitional generation between Egypt and the promised land. Aaron led with Moses coming out of Egypt. Aaron and Moses both died in the wilderness. Eleazar was partnered with Joshua in leading them out of the promised land. And it actually says that he died right after Joshua did. And Phineas became high priest after Eleazar. And he came into his role as high priest while they were actually uh, occupying Israel. But what I think is interesting here is in the story that we're talking about with the zeal of the Lord and Phineas intervening, all three generations were present in that moment. All of them were there. And I believe that what was spoken over Eleazar, it applied to all three generations. The peace of God, the shalom, the wholeness, nothing missing, nothing lacking is promised to those who have the zeal of the Lord. Passionate, consuming love for him, his word, his name, and his presence. This is a, so everything we've looked at so far has been in the Old Testament, but you guys know the Old Testament and the New Testament, it's all one story, right? And we're, we're all still part of that story because we have Revelation, and the book of Revelation is the book of the end times. And how many of you guys think we're already in the end times? We are in the end times, just in case you didn't think that. So we're going to look at Revelation now. We're going to go all the way to the last chapter of the Bible, and the section that we're going to look at is a letter to a church in a city called Pergamum. But what you're seeing here in the Bible in Revelation, in the beginning of Revelation, you have uh, Jesus, and he's giving messages to seven churches. And those seven churches are the loveless church, the persecuted church, the compromising church, the corrupt church, the dead church, the faithful church, and the lukewarm church. Not a lot of good things going on. <laughs> Lord, help us. <laughs> but Pergamum is the compromising church. And I believe this is also a message for us today. So let's look at what Jesus says in Revelation 2, 14 and 16. Jesus says, But I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold the what? The doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which, I, which thing I hate. Jesus hates things. Did you know that? Which thing I hate. He goes on to say, Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Wow. So this is Jesus talking to the church. And he doesn't sound happy, does he? In fact, he says he hates these doctrines and he's going to fight against those who refuse to repent from the doctrine of Balaam and he also says that the, another name for the doctrine of Balaam is the doctrine of the Nicolaitans now who are these Nicolaitans the Nicolaitans I hope I'm saying that right were a group within the Christian church who turned the grace of God into a sin for, a sin free for all they said that God's grace makes it possible now for us to do whatever we want to do to them, forgiveness of sin and the freedom provided through Christ gave them permission to do whatever they wanted. Through their teaching, they were actually leading the church into the very same trap that Balaam and King Balak used on Israel. Isn't this crazy? Let's go back to the slide of compromise here. The doctrine of Balaam. The slide of compromise. Jesus is talking to the compromising church. They allow the unholy fellowship. They allow sexual sin. They allow idolatry to come in. They allow bondage. They allow a curse. This is the very same thing that we see happening right now in our present time. <coughs> Unwillingness in the church to deal with pornographic material of our entertainment industry has opened a door. We have pastors who are struggling with pornography just as much as the lost people. Church doesn't want to offend anybody by telling them they can't have sex. Church doesn't want to offend anybody by telling them they can't live together. And all of that has opened the door till now. The church doesn't want to offend anybody by saying men shouldn't have sex with men. Women shouldn't have sex with women. All the boundaries have fallen down. And we say everything is okay. The LGBT movement is based in sexual sin. It's completely about sexual preference. And it's completely about sexual identity. There's no way around it. 
It would be totally fine. If a guy, if a man says, I just want to love this other brother. Hey, Jonathan and David had a, loved each other, right? Okay. Yes, have agape love. I have agape love for Jonathan. There's a difference. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> there is nothing sexual in agape love. In the Greek, there's four different kinds of love. There's agape God-like love, which is sacrificial surrender, right? There's a family kind of love. There's a brotherly love. And then there's the lowest of the loves. And even the Greeks categorized it as the lowest of the loves. Does anybody know what the word is? Eros. Eros was the most emotional and untrustworthy of loves. It was not the same as the other loves. The highest is agape. It is not the same. So yes, men, agape men. Women, agape women. That does not permit eros. There are boundaries within that that God has set. And when we go outside of those, we've trespassed. When we go outside the boundaries of God, we're trespassing. And yet, we've come to this place where we're seeing it happen in churches all over our nation where they're endorsing trespass. They say, hey, it's okay. Grace covers all that. Does it? I think you don't understand what grace is. Grace is not permission to sin. Grace is the empowerment to be holy. Grace is a gift from God that gives us the zeal of God. It gives us the heart of God. It gives us the love for what God loves, loves and hate for what God hates. Yeah. That's grace. Amen. God has mercy. He forgives us when we repent. But repentance means turning 180 degrees around. You can't continue trespassing, walking on the other side of the line and think that you're under the umbrella of blessing. It doesn't work that way. God doesn't work that way. And God, what did he say? He said, my people, I will be holy. And he said, I will be glorified. Grace. God, thank you so much for your grace. When we were baptized into the death and resurrection of Jesus, the old corrupt cursed sinner did not come out of the tomb with us. It's dead. That old sinner is still in the tomb, dead. We are no longer slaves to sin, but we are what? New creations in Jesus Christ. He gives us new hearts that pump with his zealous grace. How many of you think the doctrine of Balaam has returned? So what's the antidote? Oh, here we go. Look at Psalm 101. <clears throat> Psalm 101 verse 2 says, I will behave wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when will you come to me? Oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. Come, come, come. I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. And you guys think, oh, gosh, perfect. Who can do that? Perfect means complete. It means whole. Just like shalom. Actually, this word is very similar to shalom. I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. Guys, we are entertained by the work of those who have fallen away. And it goes on to say, it shall not cling to me. I can't even watch a trailer without junk clinging to me. It's so, <laughs> you know, you'll be watching YouTube and you'll think, oh, that looks like an interesting movie. <laughs> <laughs> Lord, get it out, get it out, get it out. That stuff clings. It's like tar. Mm -hmm. A perverse heart shall depart from me. I will not know wickedness. That word know it means to be intimate with, right? When the Bible when it talks about a woman knows a man, then they, they are intimate. When we know wickedness, we become intimate with wickedness. We have to operate in the opposite spirit of what's going on around us, and we have got to clean our hearts and our homes out, guys. We have to cleanse, cleanse ourselves completely of compromise. There is no room for compromise. Jesus obviously hates compromise. Jesus, when was he most irritated? When he walked into his father's house and it was a house of compromise. He said, my father's house is a house of prayer. prayer. And we're also told that now you and I, we are living temples. And he won't share our heart and he won't make treaties with the devil. He won't compromise. 
we got to clean it up and start walking in zealousness for him and his kingdom. The word perfect here, as I already mentioned, means complete, sound, whole. We will no longer be double-minded or divided in our hearts. We will be steadfast and walk in integrity. That's the calling of the priestly order. We will not be entertained by evil and allow it to stick to our lives. We will not allow our hearts to be perverted, and we will not be intimate with wickedness. It's time for us all to purify our hearts, purify our homes, purify our lifestyles. Because we were made to be vessels of the holy, all-powerful God. We were made to be vessels of living water. And when that living water comes in, it wants to... It, 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 what does it say about the river flowing from the throne of God? It says that where it goes, there is life. So we have to decide, are we going to hold on to dead things? Because he, he's not. And therefore, if we want to hold on to dead things, then we can't really let him flow. He wants to flow and bring life. Let go of the dead things. Leave the dead things in the tomb. Jesus didn't come to give them resurrection. He came to give you a resurrection, a resurrected life. He came to give us abundant life, overflowing, beyond measure. So let's release the dead things and the dead desires. Thank you, Lord. We've got to purify our hearts and our homes and fall passionately in love with the Lord. His name, His character, His ways. We must return to our number one love, our first love. Remember, that was one another warning that Jesus gave at one of the churches. You've forgotten your first love. Remember our first love. Let's remember our first love. When I say first, first and foremost, our most love. We dedicate our lives to worship and invite Holy Spirit to increase our passion, our ardor, our intense devotion, our fervor, our zeal. How many of you guys want to hear God say, Nate, that dude has a zeal that is my zeal. You want to hear God say that over your life? Yeah. He wants you to have his passion. And you know that it was the zeal of God that took Jesus Christ to the cross. We call it the passion of Christ. His crucifixion, we call it the passion of Christ. How in the world can that be passionate? Because it was the love of God and the zeal in him that drove him all the way to the cross. That's the zeal of God. I want that. Jesus, 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 transform our hearts. Purify our lives. Cleanse us of every distraction. The righteous response in this time is for our generation to rise up in holy zeal and restore the priesthood for believers. To take hold of the Phineas covenant of everlasting priesthood that was perfected in Jesus Christ. Time to take on the mantle of Phineas. Stand up and take action. Now let's look at Psalm 106 again. Then Phineas stood up and intervened, and the plague was stopped. And that was accounted to him for righteousness to all generations forevermore. I know some of you guys are thinking about grabbing a harpoon and sticking it in people. <laughs> That's not what we're talking about, is it? <laughs> Put your harpoons away. Huh? That's right, a harpoon of the spirit. That's what we're talking about. That's right. The word intervene here... It means intercede. It means pray. Do you know this word first shows up in Genesis 20? And it's when Abraham tells Abraham, when God tells Abraham, I want you to go pray for that king so that he'll be healed. I want you to intervene for that king. In Genesis 20, it says pray. So this is the message for us. Then Phineas stood up and prayed. But you notice it wasn't the prayer of repentance. That's good. That's first. That's, that's important. You do that first. But all the people of Israel were repenting. They were praying repentance. But it was Phineas who stood up and did a prayer of violence against the enemy. That's a whole other type of prayer. And that's the priest. That's the next step. That's what we're being called to in this generation. That's the Gen Zeal. Intervention is prayer. Say intervention, intervention is, prayer. is prayer. 
We're called to take up the weapons of our warfare, which are no longer natural, right? right? But are spiritual and have divine power to destroy strongholds, arguments, opinions, thoughts, and even disobedience against the will and ways of the kingdom. The call to you and I is to take an aggressive stance in prayer. Stand up and pray. And stop the plague of corruption, oppression, and curses that are ruling our lives, our households, and our nation, and the world. It's really good when we have those big meetings like we've had in the past where we're called to a time of repentance. But there is a next step. We get off our faces. Like Phineas, it says, stood up. We go into repentance, but we've got to stand up from repentance and take action. And it's in that action that we step into a rightness. Because that's the heart of God. That's the zeal of God. We get into alignment with the heart of God. This is the right action of the priesthood forever and all time. So stir up your holy zeal in worship. Pray, Holy Spirit, fill me up. I need. Remember what the early church prayed. They prayed, they prayed Lord, make us more bold. Yeah. So he gave them more zeal. And that was the second outpouring of Holy Spirit. If we want the zeal of the Lord, we go after Holy Spirit. Stir up your holy zeal in worship and stand up and intervene through prayer. <clears throat> it's time for God's children to take up our role as kingdom agents. We talk about that a lot, but it is time. We are called to be kingdom agents. Represent the king and his interests. Love the things he ha loves. Hate the things he hates. Declare the things that are in heaven into earth bind the, the powers of darkness loose the things of heaven Jesus said that he hates the doctrine of Balaam he hates the slide of compromise because it disempowers his people and it moves them out from the boundaries that he's given them and, he, and they're moved from being they just beat a tribe of giants that terrified the entire region. And like that, they were lured into stepping out across the boundaries and into a plague and pretty much killing their own people. <sighs> Lord, help us. So tonight, uh, this is what I want us to do. Worship team, yeah, you guys can go ahead and come and get ready. <clears throat> As we worship tonight, before we start singing, they're going to start playing. But we have three things. The first thing we're going to do is let's repent from unholy fellowship. The things that we've partnered with. The things that we've allowed ourselves to come into agreement with. And the people and the relationships. Let's repent from those things. Let's repent from sexual sin. Let's repent from idolatry. And let's repent from partnering in any way with the doctrine of Balaam compromise repent from any compromise in your life and then number two let's earnestly pray for the Lord to increase his zeal in us and so I asked the worship team just to just play your instruments we're not going to sing because the first song is all about inviting Holy Spirit that's step two first we repent then we invite the zeal of the Holy Spirit to fill us up and then number three Let's recommit to standing up and taking our place as prayer warriors. If at all possible, join us on Thursday nights and let's go after the enemy. And if you can't do that, then you definitely, definitely, it, well, whether you can do that or not, all of us need to take a place of authority in our household. Start praying prayers of authority. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Don't be a firefighter. <laughs> let's take the fight to the enemy instead of running around trying to put out these little fires that he's lighting he's running around your house lighting things on fire we're running around patting him out oh Jesus, Jesus, help us, help us, help us no, just take the dude out and kick him out thank you Lord zeal, 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 zeal stand up and intervene that is this modern that this modern plague on society will be stopped
Lord, thank you so much. Do you mind bringing down the lights? <clears throat> thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, forgive us. Forgive us, your church. Forgive us, your people, Lord, for our compromise. Lord, forgive us for partnering with these evil doctrines, these teachings. Lord, forgive us for putting up with these things, for allowing them into our house and into our thought life and into our church, into your church, Lord. Forgive us, God. Forgive us, Lord, for any way that we've partnered with that. Forgive us, Lord, for allowing ourselves to step into sexual sin. Forgive us, Lord, for idolatry. Lord, reveal to all of us if there's any place in our lives that we've allowed compromise and then we've partnered with the things of the enemy. Lord, reveal those things to us so that right now we can just throw them off in the name of Jesus Christ. We turn away from them and we say those things are dead and we embrace life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that we have all the forgiveness available and also we ask for your grace. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you would fill us up. Transform our hearts so that we are zealous for the things that God is zealous for. So that we have the zeal of God burning within our chests and through our lives, Lord. So that we would have the love of Jesus Christ that took him all the way to the cross. Thank you, Lord. And the same love that was in him that resurrected him from the dead. The same love that was in him as he ascended to the right hand of Father God. Jesus, give us your heart. Tear away the stony hearts. Tear away the hard hearts. Replace them with hearts that pump with your holy zeal. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And I pray for every person in this place tonight that we would be filled with your zeal. We'd be filled with your holy love, with your holy passion. And we would take hold of the spear of the Spirit. Thank you, Lord. We take our position as prayer warriors again. And we'd say no to the enemy. And we'd cast the enemy out. And we'd step back into our blessed, our blessed boundaries. We'd step back into the umbrella of blessing. We would become once again a holy body united, a holy priesthood united under you. Glory to you, Jesus. Glory to you, Jesus. Glory to you, Jesus. You called us to be a victorious people, just as you called us to be a holy people. Thank you, Lord. We set ourselves apart for you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Make us holy as our Father is holy. Thank you, Lord. 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 When you've repented of the things that have come into your life and the things that you've allowed and the things, the compromises you've made, the trespasses that you've taken, when you said, sorry, Lord, I apologize, and I turn away from those things, then you cast off the dead things. And now it's time to invite Holy Spirit to fill up all the space of your life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Fill us up. Fill us up. Fill up the space within us. An overflow river of living water. 